Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to Beats Research Radio, a podcast and YouTube channel dedicated to bringing our community closer to research in the science and engineering field. I'm Hallie Arnett, and I'm going to be your host on today's episode. Joining us is Dr. Todd Hoare, a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at McMaster University. Dr. Hoare's lab focuses on design of novel materials with smart properties precisely tuned to the environment and application in which they're going to be used. His laboratory specializes in hydrogel fundamentals, microgels, nanogels, drug delivery, tissue engineering, biosensing, agriculture, and personal care. Today, Dr. Hoare is here to speak to us a little bit about hydrogels and how his team is engineering them for multiple applications. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hoare, for joining us here today on Beats Research Radio. My pleasure. Thanks, Holly. So do you think you could start off by explaining to us, uh, I mentioned a few things that your lab is doing. Do you mind uh, going into a bit more detail about the current research efforts um, at your lab? Sure. So as you said, basically my lab looks at hydrogels and we look at that from any length scale. So from the bulk hydrogels, which are probably things people may be more familiar with. So the, the gunk you see in baby diapers, which you sleep at night when you're a parent of a, of a small kid or a contact lens. So something that, that you can touch and hold but also down to the nanoscale. So we work with hydrogels as small as 10 nanometers. So just to put that into perspective, it's basically taking a human hair and then dividing that 10,000 times. And that's, that's the length that's left over. Those types of hydrogels are really, really useful for things like penetrating into biological areas that are otherwise hard to access, like the brain or dense tumors. So we like to look at it from a very engineering perspective. So we look at you know what, what applications or what properties of a hydrogel do you really need for the material to be effective in a particular application. So I always start with an application in mind. And then we look at some of our tool box of, uh, of uh, abilities, particularly in terms of chemistry. So the rule in my lab, we're an engineering lab. So if it's more than two steps, we don't do it. We leave that to the chemists. So we try to stick with more simple chemistries. We also look at the morphology of the structure of the hydrogel that we form. So how big are the pores? How much does it swell? Uh, are there just different local domains that are different in composition? What do they, those do in terms of the application? We like to look at that and also try to apply some engineering tools, things like high throughput screening or a statistical modeling to see if we can accelerate the design of an optimal formulation. So based on what we know about how this formulation works, can we learn something about how a, a formulation might work better? And then we look at, again, how to, how to apply those hydrogels. And as you said, the, the range of applications is pretty broad. We, most of our work's in drug delivery and tissue engineering, but we're also doing a lot of work in agriculture now, which has been really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you can you can kind of go at the problem from two angles. So looking at the application and then tuning that hydrogel specifically for that application. Is there a base model that, that works and that you always start with when you're tackling these problems that kind of helps you like merge everything together so you're not always starting from scratch? That's a good question. So, I, I mean, as a professor who knows something about a very specific thing, you know, when you have a hammer, everything's a nail. So, uh, so I guess there's two basic things we always, we typically start with. And, and uh, one is what's called in situ gelling hydrogels. So if you ever used epoxy glue from the hardware store, you know exactly how these work. So it's basically, when you have the epoxy glue, you have these two barrels, right? And the two things, when they mix, when you extrude them together, they react and form your adhesive. So in situ gelling hydrogels are exactly the same, only you make a hydrogel instead of a, a cross-linked adhesive at the end of the day. And we think that's very useful in a lot of applications because not only can you implant something without having to surgically implant it, right? You can just deliver it through a needle and it gels inside the body. Or you can actually mix the hydrogel precursors in different geometries to make really different types of structures. So for example, for tissue engineering, we've made very small fibers just by controlling the geometry at which these come together and, ex and extruding them in the right way. So that's the one sort of base formulation we tend to go to. The other uh, formulation is what's called a nanogel, which you mentioned in your introduction. These are basically cross-linked hydrogel particles. And again, they can range in size from microns to nanometers. And uh, we've done a lot of work on these over the years in different ways to fabricate them uh, that can make them degradable, that can make them sensitive to different biological environments also responsive to different environments. So if the pH changes or the temperature changes, they can change too and change size, change charge, all those different types of things. So uh, those are the two base things we'll, we'll start with and then we'll see how they work. And if, you know, we might, you know, we've done different things as well, but uh, those are always our go-to to start at least uh, from the design process. Okay, very cool. So if, um, I guess from a, a perspective of looking outside into your lab, 
we might not be as familiar with the way you were, would manipulate the, these types of, of materials and how you would go about fabricating them. So if you're talking about something that's a bit on the, the micro scale or, or maybe even like, a I guess, macro scale versus trying to manipulate something on the nano scale, how, how different is it to, to make those hydrogels and how, how do you go about making one versus the other? That's a great question. So uh, to make nanoscale gels, usually we use templates. So either the, uh, you know, something like an oil and water emulsion, some like salad dressing, right? And you have the droplets inside the bigger phase and the size of that droplet can template the size of the nano gel we want to make, for example. So we do that. There's also ways that you can control uh, the precipitation of polymers. So basically how the polymer switches from being soluble to insoluble. Sometimes when that happens, you just make a bunch of gunk on the bottom of the flask, and that's not very useful. Mm -hmm. But if you control it and have the right components there, you can actually make particles that are stable of particular sizes. So we've done a lot of work on trying to understand how to do that. And for bulk materials, typically uh, we just use molds. So uh, we'd get a piece of silicone rubber or something, anything really, and punch it out in a particular shape, or you can 3D print a mold that has a particular more complex shape. And you just fill it with the hydrogel and let it let it cross link. So you can make very complex shapes that way if you want. All right. So um, I guess more of a biomedical application question. Uh, bioprinting is kind of becoming a lot more uh, used in, in biomedical engineering and trying to engineer materials so that we can more precisely tune them. And, and, um, and it's being used in multiple applications now. How is the hydrogel, the, the science behind uh, developing those types of hydrogels to be used in, in 3D printers? Um, is that kind of, is it evolving at the same rate that that, uh, um, or the uh, three-dimensional printing with like bio, like biomaterials, is it, are they evolving at the same rate or are there any discrepancies of the two technologies? Yeah, uh, so I'm going to give you a very biased answer to this, <laughs> but, uh, but I think the, uh, so we'll preface it with that. But, but basically all the printable inks right now that are available for hydrogels commercially are based on one of two technologies. One is calcium alginate. So when you mix, mix alginate, which is a naturally extracted product from seaweed with calcium ions, it sort of forms what's called an egg crate structure. So the calcium interacts very tightly with the alginate. And this happens at room temperature, you can form a gel really, really fast. And that's the key for 3D printing, right? So you have to be able to have something that flows mm -hmm. through the nozzle or else you can't print it. But once it's on the platform that you're printing on, it has to be stable, it has to be a stable gel. Otherwise you lose all the features you printed and there's no point doing it. So you need really, really fast gelation to make it work and this calcium alginate works. The other way that people do it is they put double bonds on different types of polymers and then irradiate it with UV light as it's printed. Those double bonds will react with each other and form cross links during the printing process, which again can happen quickly. But to our perspective, both have really significant limitations. So calcium alginate is just an ionic interaction. So when you put that in the body, there's all sorts of other ions that are there that can exchange with calcium and break this down in some cases very quickly. In some cases, it can be as short as minutes. Uh, and in the other application, the photo cross-linking, uh, you're gonna, having a, a, a permanent bond. It's not a degradable bond. And also you have to expose, if you're printing cells at the same time, you have to expose the cells to the UV light. And that, you know, for some cells that's fine and for other cells it's not. So, uh, so we've been really interested in this topic because we are making these in-situ gelling hydrogels, which we can, again, gel within a second or less, depending on how we mix them and the geometry we mix them. So we think this is a much better solution to this problem potentially, because we can get that fast gelation time so we can do the printing, but also keep our structures, but we can avoid the use of UV light and we can make a, a degradable covalent bond, which we can control how long it lasts in the body. So you can control how long the scaffold will last before it breaks down. So I think it's a really interesting question and it's something we've been thinking about a lot recently uh, because I, I really do think that 3D printing, I think the two issues are resolution, which you know there's been a lot of great developments on, we're getting there, but bioink uh, diversity and being able to actually control the degradation time and the stability of that with different types of cells. I, I think there's still a lot to do there. So uh, it's a really interesting problem. Yes. And can you quickly just explain what the difference between a uh, just a hydrogel and then an in situ hydrogel that you were just speaking about? Can you just decipher those two for our listeners? Sure. So a hydrogel is basically any polymer. If the polymer likes water and you bond it together with other polymers, cross link it, you get a hydrogel. So an in situ gelling hydrogel is just a, it's a hydrogel where the bonds are formed by mixing two component hydrogels and doing nothing else. 
So we don't have to, you know, hit it with UV light or heat it up or do anything that uh, any of the other ways people typically make conventional hydrogels. You just have to mix at room temperature under physiological conditions and you get those cross cells formed. That's the key difference. Right. So if uh, at that physiological temperature that you're talking about, that 37 degrees that that hydrogel needs to be in your body, um, mm -hmm. what type of degradation time are we looking at for the applications that your, your team is interested? Is it minutes, hours, days? It really depends, right? So for drug delivery, it depends how long you want the drug to last, right? The, the drug therapy to go. Uh, even for uh, tissue engineering, it can vary. So if we're trying to deliver cells for regenerative therapies, there's lots of interest in delivering cells in hydrogels to sort of protect them from the body during the injection and keep them viable a bit longer so we can get the cells into the site longer. Uh, typically, you know, maybe it's a week or two you want the gel to, to fully degrade and release the cell. Uh, but we're also doing a project for osteoarthritis treatments where we're putting hyd our hydrogels inside the knee to try to, uh, you know, delay at least uh, knee replacements to give people com more comfort who have osteoarthritis. In that case, you want to inject as infrequently as possible, right? So we're, we're aiming for six months or a year for the hydrogels that they are in some form to help, you know, sort of lubricate the joint, support the joint and, and help the patient uh, feel less pain. So, so I think it, it could be as, as little as hours, but up to certainly months or even years in some applications. I think it would be really cool to maybe go through the breakdown of, of that process of um, going from injecting the, the hydrogel into the patient, uh, com coming from the lab, that kind of thing. So could you walk us through that process of creating the, the, the hydrogel and then getting it uh, injected into the patient for, the, for that osteoarthritis application? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I think... Uh, one of the key challenges in terms of getting a hydrogel into somebody is sterilizing it, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can think of it like taking a piece of jello and trying to sterilize it. It's, it's really difficult, right? There's it's not a lot of good options for it. Our in situ gelling hydrogels are, are helpful there because the precursor polymers are basically based on water uh, and they're very low viscosity. So we can filter them. So that helps a lot. So we definitely first uh, filter them to sterilize them. Uh, and there's a lot of quality control you have to do as well, right? So make sure the composition is exactly what you've said uh, to make sure that uh, the gelation time is the same because the gelation time will really influence uh, how much hydrogel stays at the site versus just diffuses away. So we want to make sure that we're getting the patient not only the right dose through the syringe, but the right dose that actually forms the hydrogel so we get the exact same mechanics and the same volume every time so that the patient's going to be you know, comfortable. Uh, so those are, so we do a lot of quality control and we think a lot about sterilization to make both of those things happen. Okay, that's a very yeah, that's something that I guess you wouldn't you wouldn't initially think about when you're thinking about a hydrogel and then oh I have a blob of, of material. How am I going to get right. to the center there? So absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's definitely a an obstacle that um, might not be at the forefront of your mind when you're starting to to fabricate. Um, so a little bit on that line, uh, is that a major obstacle in hydrogel design and research in the biomedical space right now? Um, or there are, are, are there other uh, major limitations that uh, come along with, with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the use of hydrogels in biomedical applications has really expanded in the last decade. So a lot, a lot of these problems are on the way to being solved. Uh, I think sterilization is number one. And I think often when we're designing in a lab, an academic lab, a new material, I mean, we don't really care, honestly, right? We just want, oh, you know, does it have the right mechanics, the cells like it, all these types of things. We don't think about, okay, can I actually scale up the production of this? Can I make, you know, 10 kilograms of the polymer instead of one gram of the polymer? And that's why we try to stick to simpler reactions, right? One or two steps so that you could give them to a contact, contract manufacturer and you could actually do it and reproduce it. That's not always easy to do, right? Uh, can you sterilize it to a way that that's appropriate? Uh, so, so these are things I think, if you're really thinking translationally, you have to think about at the beginning of your design process. So if you sort of get through the entire process and then say, oh, wait a minute, I can't sterilize this, uh, it's not going to be translated into people. So we really try to think of that towards the beginning, at least, uh, and uh, make sure that we're designing modules that you know can be scaled up in terms of the chemistry and can be sterilized so we can you know, uh, put them in patients. Right. So what do you think if you were to advise uh, someone or a new, a new student or, or someone who's going to start working with some, some uh, hydrogels for biomedical applications, what are some key factors that you would, you would tell them to, to think about for a successful potential clinical translation of that hydrogel? 
Uh, okay, that's a great question. Uh, so I mean, sterility would be one. The other thing is, how would you how are you going to get it inside the patient, right? Uh, so uh, so hydrogels, you know, think of trying to inject jello with the wrist syringe, it doesn't work that well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have to implant versus inject, that's a huge barrier to the use of hydrogels in many applications. Not all, right? Because I mean, for example, uh, a cancer biopsy, you know, it's an invasive procedure anyway. So if you have a bulk hydrogel that you want to put in there to deliver chemotherapeutic after, maybe that's fine. Maybe, you know, you don't need something that can be easily delivered. But in other applications like osteoarthritis, if, you know, if it's not injected, nobody's going to volunteer to have their knee taken apart, have a hydrogel put in to feel better for a few months, right? It's just not going to happen. So, so I, I think delivery, uh, sterilization, and also sort of hitting a balance of mechanics and degradation, because that can be really hard. Uh, because it's easy to get the mechanics of your material right for an application right at the beginning, but to make sure that they're right enough, at least over the pat the useful duration of your device, that can be much harder. Because as the hydrogel is in the body, it can swell, it can break down. Those both reduce the strength of the hydrogel. Uh, so if there's any sort of weight bearing involved, uh, that can really, really change the, uh, the ability of the hydrogel to do its job. So thinking of sort of the sort of the life cycle and, and what the physiological environment inside the body is going to do to your hydrogel, and whether those properties that you want the hydrogel to have over however long you want it to be active can be maintained in that environment. Uh, again, it's really important to think about it at the beginning rather than the end. Right, definitely. So hopefully we have some listeners who are uh, going to take some of those uh, tips into account. Uh, and maybe a final question for you. Um, as an expert in the field, you, you were saying that you've seen some things in the past 10 years uh, start to become solved now. In the next couple of years, maybe the next decade, um, what do you hope to see solved in the field of uh, just hydrogel and engineering hydrogels for any of the applications that you work on? Uh, sure. So uh... That, that's a big question, but uh, yeah. I, I think uh, <laughs> uh, I think in particular in terms of drug delivery, uh, hydrogels are still really not very good at delivering drugs for a long time, right? Because everything that makes them good for minimizing interactions with the body, right? They have hot water in them, so they have low interfacial energy, so the proteins don't stick to them, so you don't get the same sort of uh, rejection, fibrosis, uh, you know, issues that you can get with other types of implants. Those properties are great, and that's why people like hydrogels, but they're also terrible for keeping drugs inside the hydrogel, right? Because you've got pores, you've got water, the drug just kind of flies out. Uh, so there's a lot of work that's being done on trying to prolong the use of hydrogels for delivering drugs over, you know, not just days, but months or, or uh, at least weeks. And there's some progress there, but I think there's still a lot to be done uh, to actually take advantage of the, the nice biology of hydrogels, but being able to deliver things for a lot longer. We're thinking of things like uh, injections of proteins into the eye for people who have macular degeneration, right? Right now, most mm -hmm. people go every month for these injections and for the rest of their life, basically, uh, in order to get this therapy. You know, if we could make a hydrogel that could deliver that, uh, the protein, the therapeutic protein for six months, even three months, right? Uh, that would be a huge difference. And right now, you know, there's, there's some promise, but it's in terms of translatable solutions, it's a pretty short list. I guess for tissue engineering, uh, just being able to make hydrogels in a more controlled way that we can control the structure of the pores. So it's really hard right now to make, most, most hydrogels have pores on a few nanometer scale. So that really, really small, like one ten thousandth of a hair type scale. It's real, but cells are much bigger, right? They're like a hundred times bigger. And in order for cells to make the tissue, they need to be able to talk to each other. It has to be pores that connect to each other so the cells can communicate and actually you know, over time build their own tissue. Uh, so being able to take some of the advantages of these injectable hydrogels where we don't have to surgically implant, but create those bigger pores during the injection so that the cells have the room to move around and communicate, I think there's still a lot of room to improve on that as well, uh, because I think would really expand the utility of these types of hydrogels for tissue engineering. Well, I'll definitely be keeping our, our eyes on, on your lab there at uh, McMaster University for some of the, the new advancements that we hope to see in the next 10 years <laughs> that you just spoke about. Um, so this concludes our interviews. Thank you so much, Dr. Hoare, for coming and speaking to us about uh, the awesome research that's going on at your lab. My pleasure. That's great. Uh, and thanks to all of our listeners. The Beats Research Radio is supported by the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, the Beats Research Lab, and the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and the um, Microbiology and Immunology in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. 
Thanks for tuning in and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube and podcast channels. And you can follow us on Twitter to stay in the loop for new episode releases.